We have something in store for you. And as mentioned last week, it was the first session of a series of conversations that we will be having through the month of March, through April and May as well. And these conversations are meant to educate us, to enlighten us. And we have in studio Dr. Jennifer Ross, who is a gerontologist by profession and the former director of the Division of Aging in the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Rouse attended the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC during the years 1996 to 2004, where she completed a double major in social work and Africana studies and graduated with a baccalaureate degree cum laude in May 1998. And in August of 2001, Dr. Rouse graduated with her master's degree in policy sciences with the area of concentration in aging issues. And in 2004, she graduated with her doctorate in public policy in aging. Her doctoral thesis is entitled A Case Study in Aging Policy in Trinidad and Tobago, the Role of Interest Groups in Defining New Policy Initiatives. And in August of 2003, Dr. Rouse relocated to Trinidad to assume duties as the country's first director of the Division of Aging until August 2018. So she's still fresh off of this. And the division was established to serve as an umbrella agency to focus on aging initiatives. And this is not just a solo solo conversation we're having with her. She's here with us on behalf of the Belgroves Company. So there's a lot that's being tied in together in this conversation. So good morning, Dr. Rouse. And a pleasant morning to you and to our listeners. And it's such a pleasure having you in here because you are so dedicated about what you do. You are passionate and you are you're there. You're you're right. one of you are of the people that you are standing up for and you are of the right. people that you are making these these claims to and trying to make our society more sure. aware of what is available sure. to them. So Definitely. thank you for being here with us today. You're most welcome. So can you let us know exactly, last week we spoke about your profession of being a gerontologist, sure. how you deal with the aging concept. Every time you hear that word ger, in yes. that, that, that prefix, prefix. Mm-hmm. before a word follows, it has sure. something to do with the aging population. Sure. And today we're talking about the economic issue that right. is associated with aging. Correct. Can you give us a segue? Sure. So last week, that's where we ended, where we showed how it morphed from being a social issue into being an economic one. And what is also good to know where we are now, how we got here. Before our generation, our generation now being the baby boomers, 1946 to 64, there were the traditionalists who preceded us like our parents. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand the ethos that they experienced with two world wars. And they had depression. So coming out of that backdrop of, of um, scarcity and lack, their ethic was more cut and contrive, mm-hmm. conserve. Yes. So they knew about frugality and how to be prudent. And we already spoke of as a result of the sanitation or poor sanitation and so and the high mortality and morbidity why um, families had to be large. Good? Shifting from that gear now and we come into so because of that scarcity and lack what they had different to now they were not dependent on a government for pensions which was what we mentioned the last time in talking about the process of life and aging Correct. and once people pass that 60 year mark yeah it seems as though they are only living for the government provisions correct and we did mention that when the studies were done throughout the caribbean yes. the main form of income for a retiree was pension yes and this is not something we're making no, up based it, on it is research scientists yes. have shown it and then in most of the uh, the islands again the government is the biggest employer yes good so that being said knowing that there is no dependence on a government to give you a pension then they had auxiliary support as a safety net so you had susu you had friendly society and they 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 did a lot of cooperatives Mm -hmm. good and that was the time when communities were more practicing communalism you know and your neighbor say lend me some so not lend me just you have some salt and then pick it up and that's how we lived good that's how they lived so we are the children coming out of that but what did what happened to us in from 1960s free education more travel women now are in the workforce so they were no longer the de facto caregivers as they used to which formed the safety net again in the home and then as a result of that shift 
the emphasis now was on the affluence that came with and it. And the less communal living. And the less around. communal living because communal communities got fractured. Yes. What happened then now was this um, this this dependence that we are going to work towards on this pension because remember the pension began and I must say this the pension act is 1937 coming out of um, President Roosevelt's Social Security Act of 1935 because he wanted dignity for older persons and the vulnerable. So the public assistance and social security of America trickled down into the Caribbean and you, have, you will find that a lot of pension schemes came into being in the 1930s and trade unionism, which again affected wages and how they should be uh, apportioned. That being said, now that we have these baby boomers now from the 1946 to 64 exposed to all these other amenities that our parents didn't have. Yes. The 1935 pension plan, because wages were so small, there was no way you could have asked public servants to have a deduction made for the pension. So at the time, they had what was called provident fund, not even for the public sector. That was in, in like um, the airlines and different industries. But the provident fund gave you a lump sum at the time of your retirement age at 60. And that was it. Mm -hmm. and mortality being high, you weren't expected to be alive after 62 to 65. That's unfortunate. That's unfortunate, but that was the reality. Now, that same Pension Act obtains today with just minor amendments along the way. R not taken into account, mortality is now low. Yes. We are outliving now the years that we have worked because now our post-retirement years are the still 60 years is now longer than the years we have actually worked. So we have centenarians. Yes, we okay. do. So that being said, with a public sector that is the largest employer, with a non-contributory pension plan, which is still in effect, and they are entitled to a pension till death from a non-contributory fund. Now, it was interesting that with this sh um, shock in the oil and gas price, which happened, we didn't call it, but it happened the day before. That now, I, I, was, I was in listening to Mr. Ember speak about the impact that it is having in all oil producing countries. The, the main form, uh, the, the revenue that comes out of that goes towards social programs, yes. of which pension is it's one. Mm -hmm. So that's why when there is a shock in the system and the prices dro drop drastically, those that one makes it so volatile so they have to look at their social programs but because of the government's trust to make sure that the vulnerable groups are not affected they have to ensure that money is there to cover their pensions and public assistance of good of course now that being said the union is still going to ask for wage increases and what have you but this but we stick into the point that now that it has become an economic issue and the rate at which when we calculate it every five years we grow one percent more that are over 60. Yes. it means that there is now that dependence on this pension because we no longer have in the in the proportion that we had the friendly societies the susu and whatever to support that safety net hence the dependence solely now on pensions and again science has shown that the baby boom generation is what we call the privileged generation where they did not save. Yes. So they became like just spendthrifts, not cut and contrive and conserve, but consume. Yes. And their consumption was largely, is largely, because we're still alive, on leisure and pleasure. So whereas my father wouldn't just go to London for a wedding over a weekend, he will have to use that money for a ticket for a month. Yes. we will go up fly up friday for a and wedding and come right back, back down, down that's right Monday, good course. that's what we're talking about so that has shown where the baby boomers did not save for this rainy day and then as we as you came in this morning i asked you to for us to be able to look at this from the different circles of society correct from looking at it from a millennial perspective correct. of how we look at the aging population well now there are differences whereas there are many many individuals in the aging populations when we go to the green markets we see them with their artisanal snacks and crafts and there's a whole new business that's coming up that's a that's a conversation for another day correct however there is still that portion of the baby boomer group that is dependent solely on pension plans and their nis 
Correct. You know, the, what they're getting Which back. Which is also co- being compromised now because we're living longer and, and, and their actuarial report, the 10th actuarial report has already shown where they have to freeze the amount at 3,000. They have to look at increasing the retirement age from yes. 60 to 67 maybe. Yes. And also that uh, they, they just, and, and the contributions have to be increased. Of course. And so now so, it's making a shake up in the lives of those, as you said, correct. who are no longer, I mean, the leisure has taken place. As soon as someone retires, their first thing is we're oh, going on a cruise. Yeah. And With the lump sum. Yes. And remember too, because the family, remember we said low fertility. So as the family has shrunk, there are fewer members, fewer people in the workforce contributing to the consolidated fund from which pensions are paid and then fewer persons in the family will be less persons to support the older ones when they get aged because the division of labor is not the same as the extended so that will be talked about when we um that will be spoken of when we speak with the change in the family structure but today because we focus in on the The economics that has what we have just spoken i hope we didn't go too fast for everybody to mm-hmm. hear but that has caused this dependence now on pension and almost bullying the government at times to say it's an entitlement that they have without having contributed and expectancies so what we have to ensure and w- and this is where i remembered now what has caused this don't just blame the pensioner it, it, it was the lack of retirement planning. Because yes. remember, in this education that we are doing, we are showing, we're trying to show what are the issues. What is the underlying issue here? So don't just go at the end point and say that they're miserable and they what. There was a lack of planning. So that was one of the first things, again, that the Division of Aging had to do. But I'm not here just to speak through the portal of the Division of Aging. This is even on your own. Because we are such a huge group, we have to understand private sector who is listening. And they had started there in a big way because I had done quite a number. Now, what does this retirement planning cover? It covers modules such as the legal issue because we are still in a culture of common law. So you have two families running parallel, sometimes knowing, sometimes not knowing. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with what are the legal things that affect we still have taboo about making a will so if you ask most of the families and women are still marrying men that are older than them so you will find out it is not a surprise to find many single elderly women who are now widows divorcees or unmarried this is another dimension that is strange to what was before because in the traditionalist era you married at from 16 to 25 and it was incumbent wow, you had a family <laughs> yep but you're not laid up yes, good very true. because again your millennials have shifted the marriage age to maybe 40 if at all if at all if course. at all mm-hmm. see so it is a whole dynamic that has to be um, drilled down more in that module but this is where the economic so Yes, it had people have to now pay attention and the millennials to what is happening in the environment that we spoke of. If we are looking at all the psychological economic triggers that has led the baby boomer mm-hmm. generation to this dependency on pension, can we also look at the fact that there has been a lot of continuous work maybe in one specific field for a very long time say i am a marketing rep for this Correct. company or an engineer for this company and years and years have been worked and by the time we reach 60 we're thinking okay it's time to retire where's mm-hmm. my where's my give back from Correct. my contribution to this job do you think that is also Correct. a contributor to that feeling of entitlement? entitlement well when you have a contribution and this is where now we have to promote annuities People have to now look for annuities as a as a, 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 se- a parallel in, um, investment. Good. That entitlement was, you know, there are still some thinking. I have done my three degrees. I was at mid- management CEO level, so therefore the world owes me. No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. We still have to prepare, and in that preparation, what we st- should be doing, because I held a retirement pl- um, planning seminar once for those who were 55 and yes. over. Good. 
and they left more depressed. Some were actually crying mm -hmm. because they were only hearing what they could have, should have, would have. And the time has gone because some who were present had only one more month before they retired and they were not where they should, should have, have been. been exactly. So had they known, you have to now have financial literacy planning, which the central bank offers. You have to have an attorney to guide you in what comprises an estate. All of this we were not given, you know, because again, coming from that era we the children the first generation of the traditionalists you just knew when they die the house will go to the first and mainly the first boy or male that is not so anymore yeah. see and and we now have to go and go through letters of administration instead of a, a will that was properly documented stating clearly this is how my estate is to be divided which is a part of that uh, that retirement planning as well having those commodities having Precisely. that house and having that car Precisely. whereas the millennials probably will not ever buy a house depending on their economic status depending on their yeah. their career choice a lot of people are entrepreneurs and rather rent for the entire time that they are alive even though they might rather have a house good loans are bigger expenses are different for the millennial population so mm. you see less no strangers well. and, and it's interesting that you say that because what i have discerned from the millennials being like generation y and z more than than X, because X is like President Obama's era. Yes. But the Y and Z, what I hear from some do, even if they buy a property, they don't invest in it like how we mm. know this mortgage is 30 years. Mm. If they get a job, because they are virtual, yes. they are operating in virtual spaces. So if they download and see a job with their skill sets is in Botswana or Egypt or whatever, they sell the house. And they're out of there. My parents wouldn't even think of doing that just so. Yes, of it is to buy another one. But they will just sell that, go, and then they're looking at more smaller spaces. So where we are tethered maybe to property or our parents, they are more um, tethered to their journey. Yes. Which is a good way to be because you're not attached and bogged down to location, geography. The world is theirs. And it is in that global space also confounds their choices. You remember we said about choices? Mm -hmm. And so they're almost like nomadic, not tethered. And what that has brought out now in the psychological aspect of aging, especially exacerbated with social media, they are now alienated from that conversation where you will just go and sit and speak with grandma or grandpa. They will go to movie town maybe and four of them sitting but each one their neck is bent and they're on their cell phone. Nobody's talking to one. And I am like, what is this? This is, this is, what, it's this is what it is. And that conversation that tactile stimulation well now thanks to COVID-19 we can't touch now and hug so we have to touch so you hugs. understand where yes. the alienation is going and we are gregarious people meaning we love sociability we are we are social beings we are social beings so when you but the context of being social now is changing precisely mm -hmm. and it is being and what is in the sorry to say the energy that is driving it is xenophobia and fear and that will be discussed when we deal with the psychological because I always say the acronym FEAR is false evidence appearing real. That's, that, that's a wonderful one. We will have to share that. Yeah. So that when you are fearful of some boogie, you're not sure the shape, form, size, when, how. That is underlying now, which is the segue for our next module on the health issues. You remember we went into lifestyle, chronic, non non-communicable fear is the driver mm -hmm. so you don't even know if you had to stop and deconstruct you are fearful of fear itself mm -hmm. and i was surprised to hear it on a documentary that in the ebola crisis what killed a huge percentage of them was the fear the fear of contracting it and fear affects your immune system it 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 it, it kind of almost makes you now more vulnerable because your immune system is not guarding you against viruses and all these things. So when you are really fearful, that, I mean, it just, it, it, it makes you feel 
immobilized almost. And if we follow this pathway of fear, it's taking us right back in today's conversation of proper planning. Precisely. And if those, or if all of those Precisely. attributes are set into place, the fear will reduce. Because you know the same prepared. knowledge is power. Yes, of course. And then feeling that security as well can Precisely. change the entire conversation. We are already at eleven o'clock. How the time flies! But I really do feel like we covered a lot. We yes. were supposed to take calls today, but the conversation there's we just can so take much. Them in, in the next one on on what we have covered thus far. We don't want our course. listeners to feel left out in any way, but at least we giving them material on which to ask some of the questions. But these are the issues. And next week we will be opening that phone line to you, so you can save our number. It's two 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 three one zero four. And if you would like to contact Bell Gross, because Dr. Rouse is here today, not just on behalf of her own knowledge and intelligence and, and professional background, but also on behalf of Bell Groves, who is sponsoring this program, you can call them at two two three two one seven eight. You can find them on Facebook as well. We have shared some information on them on our Facebook page, Heartbeat Radio for Women 104.1 FM. So you can have a look there and see where they are located. If you'd like to visit them, if you'd like to send them a message, you can comfortably do so. The name of their Facebook page is the Bell Belgroves TT. So you can find them. Dr. Rouse, thank you so much. You are most for welcome. Another insightful, educational, yes. and very lively conversation. And I like to know it is about minding your own business. M Y O B. We need to do that a little yeah, yeah, bit more little these bit days. More. So our conversation Thank with you. Dr. Rouse will continue next week, Wednesday. And the next following weeks to come, we will continue to elaborate on this conversation. We are Heartbeat 104.1 FM. And welcome to our number two of your Wednesday morning's edition of Matters of the Heart. Rehana Khan here with you today until 2 o'clock this afternoon. More music coming your way. Don't touch your dial. Music, magic, and memories. Heartbeat 104.1, radio for women and the men who love them.